This is the Real Estate Rookie Show number 30. My name is Ashley Kerr, and I am here with my co-host, Felipe Mejia, who is 30 years old, and this is episode number 30. And I just want to know, when we did episode 19, why we didn't say, Ashley is 19, and this is episode 19. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny, Ashley. I don't think... Everyone knows I'm 30, but no one knows your age. I don't know if you're like 17 or like 47. <laughs> it's like you can't really tell. It's interesting because actually my son's uh, previous uh, physician, doctor, whatever you call it, mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't guess her age. So yeah. she was talked about her college a lot, but she also had some gray hairs, but she wasn't, <laughs> she was like an old soul. So I couldn't figure out how old she was. Ashley one day will let us know based on the episode number. So you better, you better let it out quick. Well, we're going to find out next week then. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of next week, we have, um, we're going to do a follow-up to this episode. Today, we are talking about partnerships. We're going to give you six things rookies need to know and do to find a partner on their first deal or their next deal. And then next week, we're going to have a handful of different successful investors on the show, and they're going to give us real-life case studies of partnerships that have worked for them, maybe even bad case studies of partnerships that haven't worked for them, how they've structured them, what they looked like, you know, how, what's the percentage, whose responsibility is what, some real life case studies. So make sure you guys come back and listen to part two with the real life case studies. But today you want to um, tell everyone our, our six things we're going over, kind of summarize it. Yeah, absolutely. So today me and Ashley are going to be talking about the six things to create a great partnership as a rookie. And I know that's sometimes hard because when you first start out, you want to learn everything, you want to do everything. But but me and Ashley have both built a successful real estate business out of using partnerships because we've both realized and humbled ourselves enough to know that we don't know it all. We're not going to learn it all. You know, Ashley talks about that she's not great at construction and I'm not great at, you know, uh, Excel sheets or keeping the numbers together. So today we're going to break down the six things that we have talked about that has been beneficial and essential for us creating great partnerships, even when we first started as rookies. Ashley, do you wanna take the first one? The first thing, number one, is the missing piece. What, what are you missing that's stopping you from getting your next deal or your next partner? And do you even need a partner? What, you know, what does the partner bring to the table that you need? So let's look at time, money, knowledge, experience. Do you have any of those things or is one of those things that's you're missing? You don't have time. You have a full-time job. You've got a side hustle. you got a family. you got all these things going on. Then go and find a partner that can fill that for you. Don't just pick anybody. You want someone that, you know, is going to fit, you know, that missing puzzle piece. You know, when I first started investing uh, and realized that I needed a partner, one of the biggest things that I wanted to do was what is this person going to fill a void that I have? Like, what is it that I'm missing? And I figured, out, I figured out very quickly that the biggest thing that was affecting me was that I didn't have the time to run my numbers or or not just run them, but like keep up to date with them. I keep all the spreadsheets, keeping all the, um, you know, the receipts, making sure that I'm staying within budget. Like, I just wasn't good at that. So I needed to find a partner that strategically wanted the same thing that I wanted, but also could do the things that I wasn't good at. That's a great point. And like for my example, I wanted to really learn how to do a, a rehab, like a full blown gut rehab. And so I took on a partner who knew what he was doing in that department and we made a partnership and we beautified, you know, this property and rehabbed it and did a complete burr. But I, I would have struggled. I would have probably waited longer if I wouldn't have, you know, felt confident getting that partner. Uh, so that that's just like one example uh, for me is where it's really beneficial um, to grow my business and to kind of expand it and not just stay in my little tiny cosmetic rehabs and um, kind of adventure out and use a partner to do that. So I think as much as you can leverage a partner, the better. Yeah, agreed. And before we move on to the next one, I just want to add on there. When you're looking for a partner, just make sure that you're finding someone that is that missing piece to what you are looking for. Are you 
in a position where you understand and can accept what you're not good at. And if you are, fill that void with that partner. You don't have mm -hmm. to learn everything. You know, I don't, I, I, one of my, one of the people in my circle that keeps me running is my CPA. And I know that I'm not great at my taxes. So I brought her in to fill that void. If you're going to have a partner in real estate, make sure that they are coming in to magnify or to help with one of your weaknesses. If your weaknesses is, you know, fill in the blank for yourself, find a partner that's good at that so that you have a strength and they have a separate strength. So now you guys are a powerhouse. So like Felipe, for his last partner, he got someone with really big biceps because he doesn't have any. <laughs> <laughs> for those of you not see, watching on YouTube, why, you should have just seen Felipe's face. <laughs> so this is why I don't I don't have bicep partners because I'm uh, it's my strength. So moving on. So the first one was the missing piece. Ashley is not my missing piece. Clearly, I need a new host. No, I'm just kidding. All right. So number two is going to be: Will you add value as a partner? Are you personally a valuable partner? in this deal so okay great you found a partner that is your that that, that complements your weakest link but now are you that weak are you able to fill in that weakest link for them do they need you just like you need them is your strength also their strength then it's probably not going to work out because you're going to butt heads but you have to complement each other's weaknesses you know what i mean ashley yeah, I, that's such a good point. And I love this one because you are the one that actually taught that to me. Um, when we sat down, when I came to visit you in Nashville, what was it? Probably pre-COVID. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, we sat down and we were talking about partnerships. And that was one thing you had said to me was, you know, what do you bring to the table? Like, yeah, finding a partner is great and wanting to, you know, bring out the best in them. And you want them to be valuable to you. But also, it's so important that you bring value to them. So with my partner for the rehab, I gave him, you know, I put the money in the deal. He had no money in the deal. And that was like my value. And I did the acquisitions. I did all of that. And I, I ran everything. He just had to show up and do hard manual labor. <laughs> you say that like it's easy. Oh, he just had to show up and work, <laughs> you know, know, pick up heavy <laughs> stuff. You know, and that brings me to another point. And it's not actually on our on our quote unquote list, but you know, a lot of people undervalue time and they put more value on money. I hear this mm -hmm. all the time. Correct me if I'm wrong, Ashley. Oh, well, I'm bringing the money to the table, so I need to know what they're bringing. And it's like, that's the I easy found, part, I think. Yeah, that's <laughs> the easy part. Bringing the money to the table is the easy part. I feel like the time is almost more important than just the money. Because think mm -hmm. about it, Ashley. How long did it take that gentleman that's helping you out? to learn the skills that it takes to do what he's doing for you and your partnership. You have to value that just as much as money. Exactly. And like he was the one that, um, you know, had to, to drive there, had to put in the time. And, you know, I worked side by side with him because I wanted to learn. But, you know, even if, you know, it's they're not doing manual labor, maybe they're out trying to find the deal and you're just putting the money in when they find the deal. That still takes a lot of time. And so you really have to think about what what do you want to give up? Do you want to give up money? Do you want to give up time? Where does that that go from here? You know, one of the things that I'm going to add to this is, you know, what kind of value are you bringing to the partner is are you actually continuing to work on your strengths? It does mean no good if my partner comes in with a strength and then lays back. Hey, I'm already good at it then we're just gonna keep doing it because I've been doing this for 30 years the same way. My question is also gonna be, well, what are you doing to further your education and the strength that you have, right? So if you're really good at keeping the numbers, Excel sheets, doing this, that, the other, like, are you furthering your strengths in that? If you're a carpenter, what are you doing to get better at it, right? I see like, like if you go on Investor Girl Brit's IG, like at the very beginning, her videos were decent, her, her strategies were okay, but now she's like, it's crushing it, right? Because she's like consistently pushing that boundary and consistently getting better. So I want my partner to do the same thing. Hey, who are you mentoring under? Who's, to, you know, I'm, I'm wondering how are you growing? Are you at the top of your game right now? That's awesome. But who are you mentoring from? Who are you coaching from? Who are you learning from to continue to work on your strengths? Yeah, I love that. And um, I think it, there's so many different ways to grow yourself with personal development, but you do want to make sure that 
you know, you're, you're not just draining and focusing on your weaknesses, but the things you're already good at, there's room for improvement on those and you can get better and stronger on those things too. Um, but let's, let's talk about proof of concept on this as to okay. how you can add, you know, value as a partner. What are your thoughts on that? Proof of concept. How can you add value as a partner? So one of the things that, that I like to uh, give an example of is can I prove to my partner that I'm that I'm good at this, that I've done it before, and do I have a history on it? For example, you know, when I pitched my idea to Diego, one of my partners, I was like, hey, this property does 1500 in cash flow. This is how it does. I'm gonna show you the past six months rent roll. I'm gonna show you the deposits. I'm gonna show you what it costs to do this. I'm basically gonna show you a completed model that's now just working like a machine, and all I gotta do is oil it. And he saw that I've built three of these, so he's like, oh, okay, it's gonna cost me exactly fill in the blank how much money, and this is the return, and this is the cash on cash, and yada, 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 fill in all the blanks, and we're set. So I had proof of concept in three deals prior to presenting it to a partner um, because I think that's really important. Now, if your partner is bringing not money but time, then I want to know what they've done with their time. Why is their time a value add to myself? Do they just have time because they don't have a job, or do they have time because they've put themselves in a position where they can bring in, I don't know, uh, an expertise in plumbing or, or, or things like that. I think that, you know, putting together the proof of concept and like showing them exactly, you know, how you've been successful before or how the numbers work, the more information you can give them, the better. And I, I just want to add to this is this can work with your spouse too. If you are just starting out in real estate and you want your spouse on board, treat them like they're going to be your partner you know, get them involved or, you know, maybe not involved where you're, you know, maybe they just want to be in the loop, know what's going on or, fi you know, figure out how much involvement they want. And just as you would uh, approach a partner and just as you would find what value your partner brings to you, figure out that out with your spouse too, because sometimes not having that support at home and trying to build this business can really take a toll on you, can kind of hold you back. So I think that Everything Felipe just said, you know, just do that with your spouse too. get them on board and figure out how much they want to be involved in the process, too. Let's talk about weaknesses before we move on. But I did want to yeah. get a little personal. Your husband owns like a huge dairy farm, right? So he's not really involved in your real estate, but he supports your real estate. Is that is that right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's a small dairy farm, but um yeah, I mean, he's helped me do a little bit of rehab this winter, but other than that, he's never been involved except for like, hey, do you want to co-sign on mortgage with <laughs> me? But uh, <laughs> so I just, um, but yeah, I mean, his support, his support has been uh, so great and it's really, you know, helped me grow and scale because he was just, you know, trust me, supported me. Um, I could do whatever I wanted with it, but I also like clued him in and kept him, you know, involved as much as he wanted to be. If he wanted to know how things were going, I would tell him. And my one partner, he wants to set up uh, quarterly reports for his wife so that, you know, every quarter she'll get a statement for each entity. So she just knows what's going on, can stay in the loop. Yeah, exactly. And then, for example, my wife, she likes to be involved. She works with the numbers. She works with the spreadsheets. She pays the bills. She's like super, super involved. So, uh, you know, I, you I would think, be lost without her. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I don't know what I would do without my wife. Seriously, though. Um, you know, it's it's interesting because sometimes I get the question of like, oh, OK, I want to build a partnership with someone. And then you want to like exclude your 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 wife or your spouse. But, um, you know, if, if like you said, we have we have we both are married and, you know, your husband is not involved and my wife is involved. But our partnerships with our uh, with people outside of our marriage still work because mm -hmm. we've allowed our spouses to be as or not as involved as they desire to be. Right. So I right. think that, that I think that's what makes it work. And I think before you bring on a partner, that's something you need to sit down and figure out, too, with your spouse or your, you know, your relationship partner um, before you dive into a partnership with another person. Um, agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. So I'm glad we so touched on that. But let's talk the weaknesses now. Yeah. So one of the things that I like to tell also when I'm uh, potentially wanting to partner with somebody is don't focus on your weaknesses. Focus on your strengths. Allow them to focus on their strengths and bring those together for a, a powerhouse of a team. If you focus on trying to fix your weaknesses, then you didn't allow your partner to complement those with his strengths or her strengths. 
his or her strengths need to be the complement to your weaknesses so that you both are only working in what you thrive in, right? Mm -hmm. For example, if me and Ashley got into a deal together and she's like, hey, can you run the spreadsheets? No, 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 I can't. That's going to be a terrible business decision. Yeah, because everybody knows my my new nickname, the, <laughs> what lady, was it the, again, street, the lady in the street uh, freak in the spreadsheet. <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> I Josiah's love that. Episode. That's so but funny. Yeah, it, yeah it, so I'm going to be touching that. But yeah, one of my weaknesses, well, it used to be, you know, doing a rehab. So I found a partner to help with that. And then, um, I'm opening my liquor store and I've never had to open a retail business before. So my partner for that has five, um, restaurant franchises that he owns and he's been helping and his manager that manages all of those uh, stores for him is actually helping getting our liquor store going. So that was another way I, I leveraged a partner. And I knew that my weakness is, um, managing employees so i did not did not want to do that so that's why i took on a partner who would do that <laughs> okay, i'll go work so, for you ashley okay no you don't want to work for me <laughs> <laughs> number three okay so how to find a partner you figured Finally. out what the missing puzzle pieces you know what you need in a partner you know how you can be a good partner, what you can bring to the table, what your strengths and weaknesses are. So finding a partner. First, sit down, write a list of potential partners. It can be anybody. Think of the people you know and just write it down and then start from there. Agreed, 100%. Identify the potential partner, I think, is key. Because if you just go out willy-nilly and trying to find anyone and anyone who can maybe help excuse me, can help you, then you're going to have an issue because then you're just going to be looking for that into somebody versus identifying it that. And that's really important because you don't want to go out and look for a partner. You want to identify a partner and then find someone that fits that mold. That's why you never go to the grocery store when you're hungry because everything seems to fit. And then all of a sudden you have two baskets full of food. But if you identify what you're going to eat, you go into the grocery store, you get what you're going to eat and you leave, then you're fine. You don't have, you know, three baskets full of food. It's the same concept, I think, when finding a partner. Identify what a partner looks like. Draw it out. Write it down. Whatever works for you. And then someone has to fit that mold. So once you get that list going, you figure you know what you need in a partner. It's time to approach the partners and potential partners. And this is the scary part. This is where it's... It's hard to ask people for money for their time. But my best piece of advice on this is make sure you are bringing them an opportunity and you're not begging or making it about that you need them. Because really, th that's true. It isn't. If you have a good deal, it is going to be an opportunity for them. And they should be happy, excited that you are bringing them something that they can be a part of. For my first partner, I put a little bug in his ear about like how I wanted to do this, if he'd be interested because like his dad had done it and we would talk about it. And then when I finally found a deal that I wanted to buy, I said, hey, I think I'm going to buy this. Do you, you know, would you maybe be interested in doing it too? I showed him everything and we went and looked at the property and then we bought it. The first property we had looked at. But I think it's all about keeping that that balance of not like, please, will you, do, will you do this for me? I really need someone to loan me money, blah, blah, blah. And just showing them on paper, giving them as much information as you can, how this is an opportunity for them. And at the end of the day, they should feel lucky that you approached them for this deal. 100%. And the way that you can approach someone with opportunity is by having the numbers in place, showing history, doing what we talked about, uh, you know, earlier, making sure that you're not just bringing any and every deal to them, but something that you know is going to work and that you have history on, or if it's your first one, that you know the numbers like the back of your hand. I don't know if some of you guys watch Shark Tank, but one of the biggest things that I see that people fail in Shark Tank is they just don't know their numbers. So if you know your numbers and you have down exactly how it's going to work first year, second year, third year, et cetera, and you tell your partner, hey, this is the role that I would like you to play, and you're not just going to go to someone that doesn't fit that mold, then they know that, oh, this is great. This is where my strength is. Perfect. Then I know exactly 
that you're not wasting my time. You've done your homework on me. You've done your homework on the deal. This is a great opportunity. It's a win-win for both. Are you approachable too? So when you Super key. bring them the deal, are they are they going to feel comfortable with you too? You got to make sure that um, you know when you're presenting it, you you are approachable for the partners to be able to ask you questions for them to you know trust you. So I think that's something else you really need to to look at is make sure that they can approach you with their questions, approach with their advice, um, or with your advice that they may have to ask you during this whole process, especially if they're a new for this and maybe they haven't done real estate investing and maybe they're just the money this time and they're learning from you. But let's talk about my favorite, favorite part of this whole partnership thing is the partner presentation. I'll let you have to take over this one because <laughs> getting the financials on yourself and your partner, analyzing the deal, all that is way out of my wheelhouse. I would just cut you off because I would be so excited. Like, well, you know, make sure you get the color coded binder out. <laughs> I'm going to let Ashley do what she does best and talk about the presentation portion to the partner. Okay. So you need to go to your local Walmart, get a three ring binder and put together your presentation. Okay, let me cut you off. First of all, if you come at me with a three ring binder with all these numbers and doohickeys, Ashley, I'm walking out the door. If someone was approaching you, how would you prefer to receive it? Oh, I like this question. Okay, so honestly, I, I'm more of a history type of style. So I would, so for example, you're gonna have a successful liquor store, right? So if you were like, hey, Felipe, I wanna open up another one in Nashville, or another one no, here where I'm you partner. No, I'm talking about like, how would you want to receive the information? So that's what I'm saying. I w I I'm more of a history. Like I, I don't, uh, I personally wouldn't want to see a folder of the numbers and this is how it potentially is going to work and yada, yada, yada. Because honestly, just like Mike Tyson said, everyone has a plan until you get hit in the mouth. So for me, I want to see, have you done this before? And if you haven't, who are you mentoring under who has done it before? See, you've never done the liquor store, but you got the right team in place who has basically done what you want to do. So to me, that means more than numbers and Excel sheets. Now, as I say that, I also know a lot of people that have been very successful by following the metrics on a certain Excel sheet or you know, gathering the financials and putting it all into place. Honestly, I think you need both. Yeah, and that doesn't answer my question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you were making fun of my three ring binder approach saying that you wouldn't like that. Would you rather receive it as like a PDF in an email, a Google Doc? Would you rather- um, Over, over Chick-fil-A maybe? I, yeah, would you rather like, Sit down Over one lunch. on one. That's what I was asking. <laughs> yeah, that's how I would like it. <laughs> okay, but you're, no, that was a great point you made. And yes, all that information should be in your three ring binder or in your PDF file you are going to email someone. So to get back to that, the first thing I like to do in tab number one is your financial history. You should, <laughs> totally face rolling his eyes at me. Your financial history. I would include tax returns, your personal financial statement. You can use the app Personal Capital and it updates your um, personal or your, yeah, your personal financial statement on the daily, your net worth. And you can just print that out and put that in there. Um, I would do any businesses you already have, do profit and loss for them. You can include bank statements. I'd pull your credit karma report, add that in there. As much information about your own personal finances as possible, I would put in there. So great to have a strong foundation before you're going to go and ask someone to manage their money. You want to be able to manage your own, the money that you already have before you approach someone. And it's not about how much money you have. It's about how you manage the money you do have. And you want to prove that when you approach a partner. So the next thing would be is the deals. Do you, what's your deal history? Just like Felipe said, like, oh, how am I, you know, managing stuff? Do I have people in place? What's going on with my current businesses, the current things I'm doing, or what resources do I have for this current project? What do, basically, what do I bring to the table for this deal? And so I would include as much as you can about that. I've done the bigger pockets calculator reports showing my current properties, what they're cash flowing. Um, you know, I'll include my current financing, how that's working. Um, I'll do a profit and loss statement. I'll show as much as I can uh, an appraisal on the property. And then if you actually have a deal ready that you're ready to go on and that's you're bringing a deal to them, include that deal in there. 
do the bigger pockets calculator report, add that in there. Um, you know, add sales comparables, get those comps in there, show them, you know, this is what comparable rents are. This is what comparable sales prices are. I think the most information you can give them, the better. And then at the very end, the last tab, I would include references. Who are people you have worked with or people, um, you know, well-respected in the community who would give you a good reference? Or have you gotten financing from a bank before? Put the loan officer that you worked with in. You know, it's great to, one of the things I really love to do is be super responsive to loan officers and like get them what they need exactly when they need it. And I could ask any of my loan officers right now, I think, and I have before a bunch of them that, you know, for a recommendation for when I've gone to get seller financing on deals, I have them write me a letter saying, you know, that I was great and awesome to work with. Just like Felipe would say when asked if I was a good co-host. <laughs> I I would not put that on paper, but uh, it's there, I'm sure. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Okay, so that's what I would put in your present. So what would you add to that, I guess? No, honestly, nothing. I think that's a great that's a great example of why we work so well together, even just on this podcast, is because you are the strength to my weakness. One thing I want to add, too, it, I forgot to add in the beginning, when you do your finances, I was speaking on a, a Zoom call the other day and someone said, well, I shouldn't you be worried about like that person? What if you don't trust them with like your finance information, like financials and okay, well, you can like block out your social security number, stuff like that. But if you're partnering with this person, you want to be able to trust them with at least seeing your tax return. So I think that's a kind of a big red flag. If you don't even trust them to look at your tax return, why would you want to partner with them in the first place? Yeah, hundred percent agree with that. If you don't even have the, if you're even questioning the idea of not showing them your tax returns because of whatever reason, it's probably not going to be a good partner because a partner is going to see just about as much as your spouse is going to see when it comes to finances and business and all that. So super, super careful with that. I mean, listen to your gut, listen to your spirit, listen to everything that encompasses who you are. And if you just have a negative feeling towards this partner, walk away mm -hmm. because it's going to save you a lot of troubles, more than just money, headaches, sleepless nights, the whole bit. So just be super, super careful with that. Um, uh, but like I was saying, you know, Ashley's completely right. When it comes to partnerships and and presenting, you know, that to the other partner, that's why me and Ashley work so well together because she is definitely the strength to my weaknesses and vice versa. So it helps a lot to be able to have somebody um, that that does that. So the last part of that is closing the partner. I think it's really, 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 really important to close up that conversation with somebody by speaking about your, and we'll talk a little bit about this later, uh, that'll be our number six about goal alignment, but closing the partner is gonna be like, okay, you've presented the deal, right? Um, you have, you know how to find a partner, you know what missing piece, and you know what value they're bringing, but when you're going to close the partner, you need to make sure that it's gonna align for both of you guys, that this deal is gonna work for both of you guys, because, and like I said, we'll talk a little bit about this later, but, is one person's goal cash flow and one person's equity, then the deal's probably not gonna work. Present the deal, know each other's strengths and weaknesses, talk about what your roles are gonna be based on your strengths and weaknesses, and then see if this deal is going to work. Okay, so we've talked about uh, the four, let's move on to number five, which is going to be assets and liabilities. Now, when we say that, we don't necessarily mean structured buildings. What I'm saying is now that you've closed the deal with your partner, like I hinted before, you have to identify each other's strengths and weaknesses and assign roles and tasks based on that, right? So am I going to be swinging a hammer or is Ashley going to be the one swinging the hammer? Who's going to be, let's say that we have to purchase a, a I don't know, a, a new toilet. Who's going to go and buy it and who is going to have to put the, um, you know, the, the, the receipts in the folder virtually, who's going to set up the zoom calls, who is going to talk to the contractors. It's really important that you identify each person's weaknesses and their strengths, their assets and their liabilities. Ah, see what we did there to assign each person their tasks. What is your task? What is my task? Is that something that gets put in my strength or in your weakness? It's really important that you do that. Let me explain another reason why. If we make a list of everything that get, needs to get done in this project, 
from buying new doors, new toilets, whatever the case may be. Everything that needs to get done down to buying products, putting the receipts, opening the bank accounts, you write down a list of everything that needs to get done and then you assign tasks to each other based on your strengths and weaknesses. Oh, yielding a hammer, Felipe. Excel sheets, Ashley. Buying a toilet, picking up and delivery, Felipe. Uh, making sure that we stay within budget, Ashley. So assigning those tasks to each person based on their strengths and their weaknesses is key to making sure the project now runs smoothly. That's very important. Yeah, and when you and when you structure your partnership too, these are kind of you can put these generic things into the operating agreement. So you want to have agreement an agreement ahead of time, like stating, "Hey, when we do a rehab, we're going to sit down together and we're going to assign the task then." Or when we do a rehab. Ashley does this, Felipe does this, and it's already ahead of time, you know, laid out for you. Um, so put as much information as you can ahead of time in your agreement. So there is, there aren't any dispute, disputes and you already have your strengths and weaknesses figured out and what your job roles are going to be. Now, this isn't to play a blame game, okay? We're all human. Someone's going to drop the ball. But this is so that nothing falls through the cracks is what we're trying to identify. Let's just say that Ashley forgets to upload a receipt and we're missing $500. This isn't to say, oh, Ashley, you stole $500. It's like, no. Okay, at least now we know that was Ashley's role. So let's go look in Ashley's tabs to see where that is. Oh, look at this. Ashley forgot to upload a, a, you know, a toilet or something that we had to buy, but now at least we know where that is. So it's not about assigning who's at fault. It's about making sure that items don't fall through the cracks because the last thing you want to do is finish a rehab and you're missing $500 because, you know, fill in the blank. It's not about assigning whose fault. It's all about making sure things do not fall through the cracks. When you look at these things too, you don't even have to assign tasks. If you want to be a passive partner, outsource everything. That is an option too. A lot of time people get caught up in how to structure a deal and like whose responsibility is what. Okay, if you do this, how much equity do you get? How much cash flow do you get? Take a breath and you can outsource everything. If it is going to be that complicated for you, go ahead and outsource it. Then neither you guys are passive. There's no anything that needs to get done is you guys are each paying that fee 50-50 or however you have structured it. Don't forget that that's an option too. And then you can also pay. So like say me and Felipe are 50-50 partners. And as we go along, we don't know who's going to have time for what tasks. So we, in the beginning, we sit down and we say, okay, whoever does the bookkeeping, they're getting paid $50 a month out of the company. Whoever is going to be the project manager on the rehabs, they're getting paid, you know, $1,000 per rehab project or whatever. And you can lay those out. It doesn't have to be set in stone from the beginning that, okay, Ashley's doing this, so she's getting 60%. Felipe is doing this, so he's getting 40%. You can pay out as you go, too. 100%. Uh, you know, I think, that's, I think that's super crucial. Now we've identified assets. We've identified liabilities, your strengths, your weaknesses, how you can complement and leveraging each other towards that, assigning tasks, the whole bit. The last and most crucial step, I think, when getting ready to pull that trigger on that deal is do your goals align. And we could talk about this forever. Do your goals align is number six, because it doesn't matter how well you guys fit together. It doesn't matter how well the business is structured. I don't care how many LLCs and, and lawyers and everything that's involved. If your goal does not align for the deal, it's not gonna work. If Ashley's goal is for an equity play and mine is for a quick return in less than six months, our goals don't align no matter how much we are, um, you know, going to work well together. We have to have the same goals as to what our deal is going to be and what our outcome is for that property. Yeah. So one of my favorite things that I recently learned this past year is um, family alignment meetings with your partner. So if Felipe and I were partners and we were going to have an alignment meeting, we would invite our spouses, maybe even our kids to be a part of this because it is so important to make sure you guys are all on the same page. Um, in New York State, and I hate to be a negative and a pessimist on this, but New York State, if you get a divorce, it's 50-50. So if Felipe was going to get a divorce in New York State, his wife would you know, be entitled to 50% of the company or you know, 50% or actually 25, you know, he owns 50, so 25 of 
the total share. So she would become a partner. You know, you can pay them out, all the logistics, blah, blah, blah. But there is the chance that she could end up as being my partner. And there are ways to protect yourself from that and operating agreements, stuff like that. But I'm just saying going forward, like, it's very important to have these meetings because, you know, she could be part owner someday. But also, like, Felipe cares a lot about what she wants and what she thinks. And if you're not all on the same page and she's telling Felipe this and I'm telling Felipe this, that's going to cause a big strain in the partnership if she wants Felipe just to sell it all and they're they're moving to Waikiki, but I want to keep buying more properties. <laughs> so ha inviting your spouses to those alignment meetings, I think, is, is a great thing. You don't only want to be aligned with your your partner's goals, but you want to bring in, you know, your your spouse, your girlfriend, whoever. Yeah, a hundred percent agree with that. If you don't have everyone aligned who's in it, I've seen more businesses not make it because a spouse was in the other ear saying negatively about the other partner. So you need to make sure that everyone is aligned together with a deal to work. Now, the next part about goal alignment, I think is very important. I think listening to understand your partner and not just listening to reply to them is crucial when setting up a business plan. If me and Ashley are talking, you know, all right, we need this amount of cash flow and we're talking cash flow and we're talking cash flow, but I'm not listening to Ashley to understand why she wants cash flow and I just hear cash flow, cash flow, cash flow, then I could miss something crucial in there where Ashley might be saying, hey, I want to do cash flow so that we can reinvest that same money. And I might be thinking, oh, cash flow, so I can pay off the Tesla, right? So I have to listen to understand Ashley, not just listen to reply to my partner. That's definitely something I struggle with because I like to have control. And oh, I like we know. To do oh, it. we know. We, we know. We know. We know listening is hard for you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I think that's the first time you've made a joke at me. It's always me criticizing you. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, we got it, Ashley. Yeah, I mean, that one had a lot of truth in it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Might have not been a joke. <laughs> but yeah, I, I completely agree with that. You need to, to understand. And like, I have chosen my partners where they let me have the control and they like me to have things in control. And they're, you know, they have their things they're responsible on, but they rely on me a lot. And I, I like having that control and authority over things. Um, I wouldn't be a very good um, passive partner, I guess. I'd want to know everything that was going on, and I would just be, like, nagging them, like, oh, you know, what, what's the profit and loss look like today? <laughs> and so now that you've, you know, you have your partner, you, we've talked about, you know, kind of more of the, the mindset stuff and finding the right partner, what, what to look for, what you should be like. Let's talk about, like, okay, you found your partner, how, how do you structure it? What what are some important things you need um, when you put this partnership together? Obviously, consult an attorney. You know, you want to put it together with an attorney to make it legal and make it correct. But there are a couple things that we can recommend to you, such as an operating agreement that your attorney can drop for you. But Felipe, what are some things that you put into your operating agreement with your partner that you think um, has been really beneficial, such as things that you know, you planned out ahead of time um, so that going forward, there's no disputes, no confusion. If you've gone through steps one through five that we've already talked about, the operating agreement that you create should be easy. It should be super simple because you've already identified your strengths, identified who has what roles, and everyone is going to agree on that. So if you write down your strengths, your partner writes down their strengths in a deal, and they align to create a perfect deal, then you just now you just translate that into an operating agreement. Now, uh, you know, in the Latino culture, a big thing with us is our last name. So for us, an operating agreement is really important, but more than that, it's just who we are as a person in our last name. If I tell you I'm gonna do something, it literally breaks my heart if I do not or cannot for whatever reason. So in my operating agreement with my partners, we typically write out what we expect from each other, how we're gonna hold each other accountable to that, and then obviously just having a lawyer write it up to make it legit. And then we just go get it notarized, file it away. If we ever need it, there it is. But I can tell you this, I've looked at every one of mine once the day we created it because we've just been able to, if you follow these steps, I'm not gonna say it's gonna be perfect, but it avoids a lot of the hassles. I wanna give you guys a little tip here about like the operating agreement and Felipe, great description, what you should put in there and the important parts of it. But 
you can also ask your attorney for a sample document of an operating agreement. Or maybe you already have someone um, that has done an operating agreement and ask them for a copy of it. Maybe they can take out, you know, the different information. But what I did was my attorney actually gave me a sample copy with fill in the blanks. So now anytime I start a new par partnership, I fill in the blanks and I will add like anything um, specific in there that I need to. And then I will just have her review it and say, OK, and that saves me attorney's fees. By doing that myself, I make exactly how I want it. And then she just double checks it to make sure everything is legal and it's it's good to go. So there's, you know, other forms you can do that, too. Obviously, leases. Um, so that's just a little tip. If your attorney will do that for you guys, it saves a lot of time and um, you're able to, to fill it out yourself. Uh, one thing I want to add um, that you should have in your operating agreement and something extra you should have is life insurance. I would put in your operating agreement that it's required um, that the the entity, the company, um, hold life insurance policies on you and your partner. So why I use this, so if one of my partners um, passed away, uh, I would, um, the life insurance policy would kick in and I would use that money to pay off his family for his shares and then I would return 100% ownership of the company. And I think this is a perfect strategy, Ashley, and I don't wanna skip over this. This is really important because this shows your love, care, and commitment to not only your business partner, but to their family, mm -hmm. right? If a situation like that happens, the last thing they're gonna want is to hear about your profit and loss. They're gonna wanna, like, here's the money that you know, Joe Schmo was involved with me. Here's all of it. Go take care of whatever you need to take care of. And I'm going to take care of the asset and all of its problems. Here's the money from the life insurance. Go and, and take care of yourself and your family during this situation, because unfortunately those things happen. So yeah. the last thing you want is, oh, okay, your husband or your wife just passed away, but hey, we still got bills to pay and figure this out and just adding more stress. So adding that life insurance, I think is so important because it's such a minimal cost monthly that comes out of the asset anyways, but it guarantees that business partner's spouse, you know, at, at least the financial strain won't be there if something catastrophic like that happens. Yeah, and I look at my my own husband. He doesn't want to be partners with my other partners on real, you know, on real estate. If something were to happen to me, he doesn't want you know to have to deal with the properties. And so my partners would retain ownership, and he would get you know a cash payout, and you know that would be to to help our boys. And you know, for even people who aren't married, I mean, who. Um, you know, if you have a will, who if something happened to you, who's going to be the one that's taking on that entity and would they want to? I mean, you know, maybe it's your parents. I mean, do they want to be partners with your partner? And does your partner even want to be partners with them if something were to happen to you? And if you don't have this life insurance policy in place, what happens if your partner can't afford to pay your loved ones out? Um, and then your loved ones are are stuck trying to maybe sell that entity percentage. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, I think that's very uh, important to have is the life insurance policies. And it's uh, pretty cheap um, to get at the premium. I, I wish I could remember. I actually got just got my email yesterday uh, that I need to pay the premiums for um, my bills for the life insurance policies for my one LLC. Yeah, I agree. I don't think it's super expensive, but I think it's really worth it. Because that's like one of those things you don't really think about until you know it's something that you have to take care of. It comes out of it comes out of the cash flow of the property, so it's yeah. not something that like you got to put out of pocket. It's just part yeah. of the deal. It's part of the works, I, and yeah. I think that adds to the spouse wanting to be in on the deal. Like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Like, I can tell mm -hmm. that your partner wants to take care of me in case something happens. So, yeah, I think that eases that one. Now, the last thing we're going to talk about before we wrap up and then we'll kind of go over the six, is identifying an exit strategy or an outcome and set a timeline. I think this one's really, really, really important because with if you have your alignment meetings, you have your goals in place, you have everything ready to rock and roll, but you don't have an exit strategy in case something either something bad happens or are you gonna sell it? What's the timeline on the deal? Do you have more time than your, than your partner? 
Are you looking to rehab in 30 days and he's cool with waiting six months? Making sure the timeline matches your goal, which matches your partner is very, 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 very important. Do you guys have the same timeline and the same outcome for this deal? Yeah, and just because if you set a date like, okay, so Felipe and I are partnering, we say when we hit a million dollars in equity, we're gonna sell. That doesn't mean we have to sell. That's just the goal we're reaching for and the end date. And then when we hit that, then we reevaluate and say, okay, are we actually gonna sell or do we wanna keep going? And do we have a another timeline, another sh exit strategy we wanna hit? But the exit strategies have a couple of them. Are you able to, okay, let's look at you buy a, a duplex. Are you able to rent that out long-term? Would you be able to sell it if you needed to quickly? Are you able to do it as a short-term rental? Um, what are your options if you guys do need to get out of the partnership, if you do need to dissolve? Look at those two. What happens if one partner wants to sell and the other one doesn't? I think those are, are great things to put into the operating agreement. And those are things you need to agree upon ahead of time. Like maybe there is no option to get out until you hit that million dollars in equity. And then that's when you evaluate it. Um, so just, there's a lot to think about when it comes to partnerships, but just remember that, you know, obviously doing it legally and create, protecting yourself legally, there is right, a right way and wrong way to do it. But as far as structuring it as to who's doing what, how much equity you're getting, what your exit strategies are, what your timeline is, there's no right or wrong way you can make it work to what you and your partner want. Agreed 100%. So just making sure that you've identified those things I think is crucial when uh, doing a, a deal. So let's kind of uh, recap real quick. We have number one, when making sure that you have a great deal is missing piece. Number two, will you add value as a partner? Number three, how to find that partner? Number four, partner presentation. How are you gonna present this to your partner? potential partner, assets and liabilities. Do your strengths complement their weaknesses and vice versa? And then number six is just goal alignment. Do you guys have the same goals, extra strategies, the whole bit? Do you guys mesh in these six things? Now, me and Ashley are not lawyers, CPAs, or anything like that, but we have had successful partnerships by meeting these six criterias for each partner that we do. So make sure you guys come back and listen to next week too, where we do the case studies because Felipe and I are going to be breaking down the structure and partnership uh, that we have for ourselves with our current partners. And then we're bringing on the other investors to give their case studies. And I want you guys to call into the rookie request line too, because we would love to throw some questions at these investors too. So it's one 888 five rookie and leave a voicemail if you have a, a partnership question um, and we'll play them for the investors that we have on the show next week. And if you guys want to, um, we would love to hear your case studies. If you guys are list are currently working on a partnership or have had a successful partnership or maybe even a bad partnership, post them um, in the Facebook group. Uh, maybe we can even highlight one of those stories too next week and um, showcase that, but I think it will be awesome to share as many partnership stories as we can um, this week. That is going to cover today's show. Super excited. This is Felipe Mejia, as always, number one co-host. <laughs> Am I your number one co-host, Ashley? Yes, no? you are. <laughs> Maybe? Okay. And she is Ashley Care. Ashley, where can they find us on social media? At Wealth from Rentals for me, and it is Tiny Biceps for Felipe Mejia. <laughs> If someone types that in and someone makes a fake, I'm going to be so mad. As soon as we get off, I'm going to look at that's a real Instagram account. So mine's Felipe Mejia, R-E-I. This was fun today. I mean, you and I was... talk about partnerships a lot and it was fun to, mm -hmm. to do an episode on that. And I can't wait to like get into the nitty gritty next week and really talk about what the percentage ships are, who's responsible for exactly what. But this was good kind of getting the foundation down as to why you might need a partner, or how to find one what to look for, and what to do. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. And we'll see you guys next week. Thank you. Mm -hmm.